This video was brought to you by Nebula. Last week, China published yet another set of disappointing economic numbers. Not only was GDP growth lower than was expected, but year-on-year -year inflation came in at 0%, sparking some anxiety among Chinese policymakers and analysts about the prospects of China falling into a deflationary spiral akin to what happened to Japan 30 years ago. So in this video, we're going to take another look at China's struggling economy, the deflationary risks, and whether China could really become the new Japan. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. So before we get into whether China might end up like Japan, we've first got to explain to you exactly what happened to Japan in the 90s. Now, what happened in this time period is still subject to academic dispute, but the broad outlines of it are that after decades of rapid economic growth, in the early 90s, Japan experienced a massive financial crisis that the Japanese economy has never quite recovered from. For context, in the post-war years, Japan experienced many decades of rapid economic growth in a period dubbed the Japanese Miracle. From 1955 to 1990, Japanese growth averaged 6.8% per year, and GDP multiplied eight times, with growth falling below 3% only once during the 1974 oil shock. Interestingly, Japan's economic success created some tensions with America, in much the same way that China's has. Americans blame Japan for stealing American manufacturing jobs. Members of Congress literally gathered on the Capitol lawn to smash Japanese electronics with sledgehammers, and American analysts started anxiously predicting that Japan's economy would overtake America's sometime in the early 2000s. Clearly then, there are parallels between America's anxiety about Japan in the 80s and the anxiety directed towards China today. Some of the discourse was also eerily similar. The Atlantic ran a piece arguing that the US needed to, quote, contain Japan. There were books written about Japan's alleged artificial intelligence capabilities, and Donald Trump even took an ad out in the New York Times, warning Americans that Japan was stealing American jobs. Anyway, this anxiety subsided in the 90s, when Japan experienced an enormous economic crisis. And there were basically three stages to this crisis. The first stage came in the late 80s, when rampant speculation inflated a massive asset price bubble. Between 1984 and 1990, Japan's stock index, which covers 225 of its largest publicly owned companies, nearly quadrupled, and house prices basically tripled. Similarly, between 1983 and 1991, commercial real estate valuations literally quintupled. Now, the second stage of this crisis came in the early 90s, when the bubble itself burst. Now, the first signs of this came in 1990, when the stock market started declining. And by 91, it had come down nearly 50% from its previous year peak. And soon after, house prices also started falling. Residential house prices fell by more than 50% in the decade after 1990 and commercial property prices fell by something like 85%. The third and final stage comes some decades afterwards, when Japan suffered a sustained period of economic stagnation, and perhaps most significantly, deflation. This period after Japan's asset price bubble burst is sometimes known as the lost decade. But given that growth and inflation both remained close to zero until very recently, it's probably more accurate to describe this period as the lost few decades. Now, no one knows for sure why Japan was unable to get out of its economic funk for so long, but perhaps the most compelling account came in the early 2000s when Japanese-American economist Richard Ku wrote a book called The Balance Sheet Recession. Essentially, Ku argues that Japanese households and companies had taken out too much debt when asset prices were rising, so when asset prices fell in the early 90s, Japanese individuals had to focus on paying down their debts. In other words, repairing their balance sheets. While this might make sense on an individual level, for example, if the price of your house goes down steeply, it makes sense to focus on paying off your mortgage in order to reduce the risk of bankruptcy. 
if everyone in the economy starts doing this at the same time, then the economy stagnates. This also explains why the Bank of Japan was unable to get the economy going with its unorthodox monetary policy, which included bringing interest rates below zero and buying up loads of corporate debt. If Japanese households and companies are still focused on debt minimization instead of profit maximization, then cheaper borrowing rates were never really going to change anything because they don't want to borrow more money anyway. All in all, this lack of demand meant that prices never recovered, pushing Japan into a chronic deflationary state. Now, while this might sound good, especially if you're living in a country that's struggling with high inflation right now, actual deflation is pretty terrible news for any economy because it creates a downward spiral of self-fulfilling recessionary expectations by discouraging borrowing. Anyway, that same Richard Ku, as well as other analysts, have recently been warning that China is on track to suffer its own balance sheet recession, noting the glaring similarities between China today and Japan 30 years ago. Like Japan in the 80s and 90s, China has its very own debt fueled property bubble, an export-driven economy, weak consumer demand, an aging population, and rising youth unemployment rates. And maybe proving the point, Chinese companies and individuals are already starting to reduce their borrowing. While this might sound like a good thing given the debt pressures on certain sectors of the Chinese economy, it might also be a symptom of the fact that Chinese individuals and companies are already drowning in debt and are now focused on debt minimization instead of profit maximization. And if that's the case, then the Chinese economy is primed for a balance sheet recession and potentially a period of prolonged economic stagnation akin to what happened in Japan. Similarly, like Japan, interest rate cuts by the PBOC have been unable to stimulate growth in China and inflation is worryingly low. In fact, year-on-year -year inflation came in at 0% in June. Nonetheless, despite these similarities, there are respects in which the Chinese market is significantly different from Japan. For starters, the Chinese government has a tighter control over the economy than the Japanese government did, and it's possible that the CCP's foresight and more interventionist tendencies might stop China from falling into Japan's deflationary trap. And so far, this does already look plausible. While China's property market has slowed or stagnated, we haven't seen the same steep decline in prices akin to what happened in Japan. At least, for now. But perhaps the main advantage the CCP has is that they've already seen what happened to Japan, and Chinese policymakers are aware of the threat that a balance sheet recession poses. But despite this knowledge, the CCP are still presented with a difficult dilemma. The most obvious way to get out of a balance sheet recession is lots of fiscal stimulus. You just give everyone tons of money until they stop worrying about their debt. In the Chinese case, for example, you could give loads of money to property developers to improve home buyer confidence and reduce developers' debt burdens. And this is actually what Ku has recommended. But while this might work in the short term, it will only perpetuate the unbalanced growth that the CCP has become so worried about recently. As a final thing to note, though, another reason that China's been in the news a lot lately is its relationship with NATO. At the NATO summit earlier this month, a big question on the agenda was how NATO would define their relationship with China, and whether NATO would open a liaison office in Tokyo, which the Chinese have made abundantly clear they don't like the idea of. And we got the chance to ask The Economist's defense editor, Shashank Joshi, about this at the summit. NATO is interested in Asia primarily because Asia is more interested in NATO. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is China's rise as an economic, political, military actor means that it is imposing itself in the European Atlantic area, mm -hmm. whether that's in the cyber domain, whether that's through areas that don't pay as much heed to geography like space, what China's doing in space. Uh, China's growing nuclear arsenal uh, can increasingly reach new, uh, European states. So this isn't a case of NATO chasing dragons 
problems in Asia. This is a case of China affecting European security. Now, there are debates among allies over how far NATO should respond to that. And mm -hmm. Clearly, the issue of a liaison office or a political office in Tokyo is somewhere where we, we don't see consensus. Mm -hmm. But I think there is consensus on the idea that partnerships with Japan, Australia, South Korea, countries that see China day to day mm -hmm. are going to be vital. And if I can give just one example of this in the way these things are connected in ways people don't always realize, let's look at the Ukrainian offensive and the degree to which it relies on a guaranteed sustainable supply line of shells. Who's providing those shells? Well, a lot of them are being provided by South Korea. Without South Korea, this offensive doesn't happen in the same way. And I think that's just a great example of the way in which stuff we think of as happening over there in Asia is actually directly affecting the European theatre as well. Absolutely. If you're interested in these kinds of things, you should check out Neo's series, Under Exposure. This beautifully produced series from one of our favourite creators runs through a number of shadowy and unexplained situations, from how the Twin Towers were built to the raid on Bin Laden or the worst aviation accident in history. As I'm sure you can see, this series is stunningly produced, and the research behind it is honestly even more impressive. If that sounds good to you, then you can watch this series alongside a load of others which perfectly complement TLDR videos exclusively on our streaming service, Nebula, where you can also find a bunch of TLDR content too. That's because we post all of our videos ad-free on Nebula, as well as sharing some of our videos there before they ever make it to YouTube. Not only that, we also release hours worth of content only on Nebula every month, from extended editions of our show The Daily Briefing, to exclusive explainers and behind the scenes clips. And the good news is that all of this, TLDR content, exclusive documentary series, and a bunch of other brilliant creators are available at a great price. That's because if you sign up using our link in the description, then you can get Nebula for less than £2 a month. So help out the channel and learn more by signing up to Nebula. Thanks for your support.